So the first speaker will be Vincent M. Rendazzo, uh, Chartered Market Technician. And Vincent has uh, about 20 years' experience in the field and is highly regarded. And uh, interestingly, had uh, worked early in his career with our second speaker tonight. Vinny, number one, has about eight slides that he's going to present and discuss and take questions, and then we'll go through each uh, presenter successfully, successively, and then come back uh, after they're questioned uh, to general questions. So please give a warm welcome to Vincent and Rendazzo from the Lowry team. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're enjoying your your meals. Um, wanted to give you an overview from a different perspective, and, and I think what we try to do is uh, track what what are people doing. You know, where is the money going versus what are people saying versus um, how are people feeling about the market. So really tracking back to supply and demand. You know, that, that's what we do. We don't really, um, price, is, price is a factor, but it's one of the last things we actually look at. So it's an interesting approach. Um, and, I, and I would say, yes, it, it falls into the category of technical analysis, but it really uh, is, its own, uh, is its own animal in terms of what we do and how long we've been doing it since 1938. And, um, and how successful we've been at it, especially about uh, being early on calling uh, major bear markets. So that's that's sort of how we how we look at how we look at things, and, and we'll get a little more into it. <clears throat> so exactly, you know, what do we do? I wanted to clear the air about what what we do. You know, this is not um, this is not uh, you know, made up as we go along. This is all based on market statistics, and 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 we take the data from the market and we bring it. You know, we bring it to you, and, and we interpret it um, the way we have for you know the last 80 or so years. So what do we do? We look at objectively monitoring the um, the balance of supply and demand, and we again use market statistics. Whether that's up volume, down volume, advancing issues, points gain, etc. We are very much like CFAs in the sense that we are a facts-based. Um, analysis. In other words, you know, only what we can see and quantify is how we look at the markets. So there are no opinions. There is no emotion. Um, there is no um, a viewpoint per se. We are just interpreting what the market is telling us, and we just happen to have developed the tools to accurately um, determine what what the market is most likely to do next on a probabilities you know, weighted basis. So part of that goes with understanding that market prices are only one part of the picture. And they can often be misleading, especially at the end of bull markets or near the end of bull markets, where often, because of index construction uh, being what it is, you know, the large, large cap stocks sort of dominate. They tend to be the last to fall, the highest quality large cap stocks tend to be the last to fall. So then you, you have a situations, even going back to the 1920s, where the, uh, the major indexes continue to climb, but under the surface you have degradation going on in terms of the percent of stocks uh, down 20% or more, the advanced decline line. You know, some of the things that we're going to talk about right now. Um, and, and I think that when you look at you know, what is sort of uh, a little bit less um, quantifiable or in a, in a framework that really makes sense is trying to think that you can impose your will on the market, um, having opinions, having narratives. I mean, I think all of these things, they promote emotion and they promote uh, a lack of objectivity. And that's uh, against everything that we stand for. So we see that as sort of, you know, quote unquote voodoo uh, in, in our eyes. So what did we say last year? So we were here in January last year, and i um, glad to be asked back. But um, one of the things that we said, so uh, one of the things that we were, were, the main point was basically that, hey, this is a correction. We're not creating off the cliff into another bear market. And this is a great buying opportunity. And that was actually the language that we used. I pulled uh, two of the slides from the presentation at that time. The one on the left is uh, represented of how many stocks are above their 
10 week and 30 week moving averages. So again, just quantifiable. Now that's a derivative of price, but it just tells you at that time um, that, that you really had a washout event. There were only 7% of stocks trading above their 10 week moving averages. There was only um, about 11% of stocks trading above their 30 week moving averages. And if you looked at the five day moving average of NYSC new lows, you would have to go back to 2008 to get such a, such a low number. So you had a really intense market low um, in late December of 2018. And if you looked on the other side of the coin, you know, what are the, what are the weakest stocks doing? So the percent of stocks down 20% or more, that was also at washout bear market levels. Uh, what you would see at the bottom of bear market or bottom of major correction. Uh, almost 80% of all stocks in our universe, which is over 3,000 stocks, were down 20% or more from 52-week highs. So that to us said, uh, this, this is a market reset. So I think part of that is saying, um, A, this was a great buying opportunity, and B, this is a market reset. So people are saying, yeah, the, the, market, the, the bull market is 11 years old. And I say, well, that might be true you know, structurally, but you know, there are cyclical components, you know, cyclical bull markets that run concurrent. And it looks like we had a cyclical reset in December of 2018. You say, okay, fine, that's great, but, you know, where are we right now? So right now, we look at a continuation of what we just talked about, momentum, the percentage of stocks that are in uptrends on an intermediate long-term basis. So we could see that big, wa that big wipeout turn into a huge rebound. And you know, to us, at that point in time, you have to look at this from a few different ways, right? So you have to look at it as, how low did you get? So we got to a washout level. How strong was the rebound? If the rebound was very strong, typically you will move w way to the top of this chart. And in the case of uh, percent of stocks above the 10, uh, the 10 week moving average, you got above 90%. That only happens in this bull market. It's only happened two other times, and they're both coming out of the major corrections, one in, after the 2011 correction, one after the 2016 correction, and now this one. So that was um, kind of a restarting of the bull market in a really, in a really uh, convincing way to say that, hey, this is really, uh, this is really happening. And, and what I think is most interesting about this chart, if we, if we look at the current situation, is that these numbers are still improving. So after that initial rebound, you saw leveling out. And part of this is just mathematics of it, right? Because towards the end of that decline, a lot of these moving averages were negative. So they, were, they had negative slopes. So it's very easy to then pop back above them. But as you go further on uh, in the advance, you get a more difficult uh, up, uh, difficult to, to make that happen, right? So we saw the uh, kind of a stall, I guess, stall pattern kind of in the second and the third quarter of last year. And then in the fourth quarter of last year, they started to reaccelerate. And this has started again. So now you have over 80% of stocks trading above their 50 and 150 day moving averages, which means that the vast majority of stocks are in healthy uptrends. Now, the point to make here is that ahead of major declines, these numbers, especially the percent of stocks above the 30-week moving average, are going to deteriorate for a period of at least a year of lower highs. Um, so the fact that that process hasn't even started yet tells us that this market is still in a recovery phase. And after a 30% up year last year, that might be hard to believe. But uh, the numbers are what they are, and history is what it is. I mean, our advantage is that we can look back through 90 years of history and seeing how does this play out. And this is pretty typical of a newer bull cycle rather than an than older one. So that, that's, all, that's all well and good, but that's, that's a price derivative, right? We want to know what, what are the vast majority of stocks doing in terms of advancing versus declining, and that's why we use the advanced decline lines. Now, I have on here two different flavors for that. 
Uh, one is the S&P indexes, which we break out, the S&P 500, 400, 600 for the, for the large, mid, and small, respectively. And then we have our own universe of stocks, uh, for which is basically similar, similar construction, but the small cap is very, very different. It has a, a lot of lower quality issues and uh, really micro cap tilt. So what I think is most interesting as a takeaway from this slide is not only do we have a broad-based advance because all three market cap segments are in very clear, defined uptrends, but you even have the, um, the small cap OCO, which is the operating company's only Lowry's universe, making new all-time highs. And we did a paper about this in uh, July of last year. And basically what we found was, when we looked back and we said, when do you see lags in the small caps? Because that was a big, uh, a big thing that bear was, the bears were kind of clinging to towards the middle of last year. They were saying, well, yeah, the small caps, they just look, they look really crummy. And the study we did basically shows, okay, it really depends on when you see that weakness. If you see that weakness ahead of, um, or after a major decline of let's say 15% or more, that tends to be pretty normal because you think about risk appetite um, and liquidity, people don't want to just believe right away that we're in a new bull market. They're gonna, they're gonna be very careful about the way they redeploy capital, even if they do believe we're in a, we're in a new bull market. Cycle. So what will happen is they'll go to the large caps first, then they'll go to the mid caps, and then eventually they'll find their way to the small and the micro cap stocks. So the fact that these, even these small low quality stocks that we have in our OCO small cap universe have made new highs, um, that, that tells you a lot about what's going on internally with the market. And, and also in that study, the other big takeaway was once the small cap OCO um, advanced decline line makes a new high, its first new high after that 15 or 20% drawdown, um, which we did in November of last year, you have about 26 to 28 months um, in, in this bull market. That's only two observations. This would be the third one uh, until the market peaks. So the point being is that you know this is a pretty, again, an early indication of uh, a market recovering from a major market decline. So next we say, okay, fine, that's, that's breath, you know, but with decimalization, all you really need is a tenth to get, to get in the positive or, or, or a tenth to get in the negative. So what does this really tell you? Well, one, one thing I could say is that this is, not, this is not just Apple. This is not just the technology sector. This is a broad group of stocks. Uh, one of the ways that we look at this from a stock participation basis is show me the percent of stocks in our universe that are trading within 2% of new highs, within 5% of new highs, and within 10% of new highs. Um, you can't fool the market. You know, you can talk about the Fed, you can talk about the balance sheet, you can talk about you know, whatever you want, but you, know, you can't fool these numbers. These numbers are telling you that there's very strong participation in stocks in general. So it's not just a few stocks that are carrying this market, it's a whole host of stocks. They go from large cap to small cap to micro cap. And um, again, the trend is important here. Because somebody can say that, well, we saw the same number that we're just seeing now. We saw that same number in about September of 2018. And they might view that as a negative. But I would say, well, that, that's directionally a different situation because that was a distinctly lower high than what we saw in January of 2018. Whereas now, we continue to see new highs, and this slide is updated as of December 31st, but as of, as of last week or as of this week, you, you still have these numbers making new highs. So uh, participation is still expanding, the bull market is still getting better. And the next question people ask is, okay, well, I mean, how long can this possibly go on for, right? I mean, they use that, they use that number uh, of saying this is, you know, this, this, this bull market is, uh, however many years old, right, 11 years old, going on 11 years old. And I say, well, you know, we don't really know, but we did a study which basically went through, since 1940, expansions in our short-term index, which is our proprietary measure of short-term demand, again, just straight market statistics, advancing issues, points up, up, up volume, okay? And it's saying, when you get short 
bursts, short-term bursts of demand, very strong demand, I liken it to um, sort of like escape velocity, right? Where you think about it, you know, the, the, the SpaceX is trying to get off the ground and the sellers are, is your, are, are your gravitational pull, right? So at what point can we get enough demand to just wipe out those sellers and, and get them totally out of the way? So, uh, so anyway, we did this study and we found that coming off the low in December of 18, you had this another big expansion. And we said, okay, well, let's look back through history since 1940 and say, when else have we had these expansions? Well, there was only nine other occurrences. The data's right here. What I think is interesting, number one, is that you get really robust returns over the next three months, six months, 12 months, and typically 24 months, although there is one outlier there that there was a negative return. Um, but two, and I think this is more important because the market doesn't care about my arbitrary time measures. It doesn't care what is three months, six months, 12 months. The market cannot tell time. It doesn't matter. Uh, what's more relevant is how long did it take to the next cycle peak? And in this case, the average to the next cycle peak. In other words, until the next 20% re downturn, well, let's just say around 20% drawdown, how much time passed? On average, it was 39 months. The other thing I think is really interesting is you you know you look at you know look at these numbers and the, the the occurrence that we have going right now has outpaced every single time frame against the average so far. Does that mean that it's going to happen going forward? No. But what we can do is look back in history and say, well, what other ones did that? And what were the commonalities? You know, what were the common traits? Well, you can see that some of these are highlighted in a kind of a light pink. The light pink were from when the, the data didn't perform as well as the others. Um, in most cases, it was because it took a longer time to get a buy signal from our, from our buying power and selling pressure indexes. So in this case, this most recent case, we had a buy signal within a day. So it was a very close, um, very close buy signal. And you can see how that one's compared you know, along the way. So the only ones that were kind of on the same pace, outperforming at every, um, at every update, have, was 1962 off the low, and then 1982 off the low there. So, you know, we don't know what we're gonna get, but again, this is a probabilities game. So probabilities through here would suggest that uh, we're still probably in kind of the early stages of this cyclical recovery, which is in line with what we just talked about with the small caps. Uh, it's in line with what we talked about with the momentum and, and the breadth indicators too. So I think we have a really good uh, kind of compelling case to make here. And you know, the basic bottom line here is that we continue to see evidence of a healthy bull market. Um, and this is probably a year, maybe not going to be as strong as last year, but certainly um, with the still strengthening conditions that we see, um, there's, there's potential this is going to surprise the upside because I think a lot of people, even the more bill the bullish people out there, they say, you know, kind of high high single-digit returns on the S&P, you know, pretty conservative. But, um, but that may not be the case. I mean, we just have to wait and see. And I think that, again, it's important to remember just as a final point, and I try to make this point as much as I can with clients, is that, you know, bull markets, they do not die of old age. You know, humans do, but bull markets don't. Um, they die of weakening demand and, uh, and ramping supply. So as prices move higher, people are more and more willing to sell. And they have trouble, from a valuation standpoint, finding new stocks to buy. That's what kills a, that's what kills a bull market. Every single bull market over the last 90 years that we've studied, we've noticed the, common, you know, the commonalities between those. So it's a process. Uh, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of deterioration ahead of time. So when anybody talks to me about a market crash, um, like 87, for example, well, there was a six-month advanced decline line divergence ahead of that. 1929, another great example. People say it was a crash. It, was not, it wasn't a crash. There was a two-year advanced decline line divergence. We had sell sig you know, we had, you know, our indicators had a sell signal. Same thing with before 87, we had a sell signal uh, within two weeks before the quote-unquote crash. So um, if you know what to look for, if you know what to listen to, um, the, right. the market will tell you if it is healthy uh, or unhealthy. So again, look past price. 
look at these indicators about where the money is actually going, what the stocks are actually doing, how much participation there is, and um, the number of stocks that are actually going up and, 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 uh, and, and, and participating in, in the advance. Uh, that's, those are the things that really matter. So thank you for your time, everybody. Um, I appreciate the attention and uh, I look forward to the questions. Hello, everybody. Um, delighted to be here again. What is this, 15? 15 years. Wow. And I grew a beard in that time. All right. Um, this is the latest installment of What Do You Think and Why? That's basically what I do. I ask our three panelists questions. They give us answers. I go back to them with a follow-up. They give us more answers. Then we go to all of you. You ask questions. Please think of them along the way. Okay? All right, otherwise there'll be stone silence here. We don't want that. Or I'll have to think of more questions, and you really don't want that. It gets boring after a while. And then we go to closing comments, or actually comment. Uh, something that our panelists would like to leave with all of us. It can be something we discussed this evening, something that they're working on, something that they're that, uh, that was brought up into the, uh, in the discussion, something that wasn't brought up in the discussion. And then with that, then we will thank you and you'll earn your continuing education credits from the CFA Institute. For those of you that are CFA charter members. How many of you are CFA charter holders? Majority, but not all. Okay, very good. <clears throat> all right, so what we're going to do here for starters is I'm going to ask our panelists to give us just a, a brief introduction, not Vincenzo, you've already done it, okay? We've got one Vincenzo out of the way. Okay, we'll go to Kenny and then Doug. You know, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, you know, why you're here. <laughs> Perfect. Good evening. Thank you for having me. And I'll tell you, I do not have a PowerPoint presentation, just so you know. I spent uh, 40 years on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange as an institutional equity broker representing the interests of institutions, not only in this country, but around the world, at the point of sale, right? Uh, so I lived it all. And when, you know, I, from 1980 and the birth of the greatest bull market in, in, uh, in 1982 to the crash of 1987, whether Vinny wants to say it's a crash or not, on that day, if you were there, it crashed. Uh, to the tech boom of the 90s, to the turn of the century, to the dot-com boom and bubble, which then also crashed, uh, to the events of, uh, to the modernization of the markets post, uh, post the turn of the century, and then the events of 9-11, which forever changed the conversation in this country in terms of the U.S. capital markets, how they operate, um, how they function and how we're represented to the exchanges going public, which then caused them all to answer to a new, to a new uh, set of bosses, i.e. shareholders, uh, to the great financial crisis of 2007 through 2015 to where we are today. My, I left that job in January of 2018 and I moved to Florida and I joined a, uh, a, a, an independent RAA out of, uh, based out of Jupiter, Slatestone Wealth. We manage just over a billion dollars as their chief market strategist as well as the relationship manager. So in that case, I represent the interests of the firm broadly. I'm not a portfolio manager, so I won't pick individual names, but I'll talk broadly about the markets. Um, in addition, I do, some of you may or may not know, but I do a lot of market commentary on, on CNBC. Uh, I did that while I was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I also do that now remotely from Florida as well as in New York when I when uh, when I'm there. So that's kind of my background. My perspective is very different from Vinny's. Um, while I am a chartist versus more, while I'm more of a, a technician than a fundamentalist, um, I'm not nearly as granular as a Lowry research and as Vinny has. And so, you know, I'll, I, I, I speak really more from the gut, but that's really my training uh, and my sense. And anyone who's seen me, anyone who's seen me uh, on CNBC talk, they'll, they'll understand that I, I talk more on uh, the sense and the tone of the markets versus uh, specific statistics the way that Vinny has brought out. Both sides are very important. Certainly what Vinny has to say is important, but from a, from a uh, kind of an investment perspective, uh, in my role as a chief market strategist, I speak much more broadly about the sectors and not individuals. Yeah, that's great. You missed and we, something very important. What did I miss? Cooking. 
Oh, and I cook. Uh, but I think a lot of you know that, right? Uh, I do cook, and in my daily note, I, after I write my daily note, which is really a note on the markets, from my perspective, from spending 40 years on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, I feed you every day. So every day at the end of my note, I give you a recipe. Um, I don't know. I, I forget what I gave you today. I think, oh, I gave you risotto today. I gave you a sausage risotto today. By the way, it's delicious. Yes, I gave you linguine with artichokes and pancetta. But uh, yeah, that's just a side gig. Listen, I'm the middle of five from a Boston Italian family. So I grew up cooking with a pot in one hand and a spatula in the other. So it's just normal for me. Um, and we could talk about later, we could talk about how that happened, the note with the food. It was all a mistake. But in fact, it's turned out to be, um, it's turned out to be a very interesting note and uh, has uh, a, a fairly large following. So your favorite scene in The Godfather was when Clemenza was making the uh, uh, the sauce and then you throw in the uh, <laughs> throw in the tomatoes no. and put some leave the gun, some, take uh, the sugar in it. Come on. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, a different kind of cooking. Okay, Doug, who's also a TV guy. Doug, tell us a little bit about yourself. It Turn was, the microphone it toward was, you. Um, it was Barsini all along. Barsini. <laughs> it was Barsini. Barsini. That's right. Um, so it's nice to be here again. I've probably done this 10 times. A bunch. Would you say? That's for sure. Great. Um, six. Six times. Six. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Phil, it feels like 10. He's counting. <laughs> Phil, it feels like 10. <laughs> yeah. Um, you were the guy that uh, drove up in a Bentley and had all the 20 something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning red now. So, um, so I have an unusual start to Wall Street. Um, I was actually getting my doctorate in philosophy at Princeton University. And um, my father passed away. We didn't have, my family didn't have much money. And my mother called me and said, you know, I don't know about being a doctor in philosophy under the circumstances. So I transferred. I went to uh, get my MBA at Wharton. Uh, my first job was not on Wall Street, but I wrote a book. I was a Nader Raider, and for those that don't know the 60s and early 70s, Ralph Nader was the leading consumer advocate in the, advocate in the country. He's responsible for the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, all automobile regulations, um, safety belts, um, shatterproof windows, uh, uh, windshields, etc. And we wrote a book called Citibank. My sister, who was a socialist at the time, wasn't speaking to me because I transferred from Princeton to Wharton. And um, she went to Madison, University of Wisconsin at Madison, and she took a banking course. And my book was a textbook. So it broke the ice, and she's talked to me ever since. Um, <laughs> I left to become a housing analyst at Kidder Peabody. Then I worked for almost a decade in Boston as the economist at Putnam Management. Um, and then I founded a, an investment firm called Glickenhaus & Company in New York City, which was pretty, we did, had a good run. And um, I currently, um, actually restarting a hedge fund, I manage managed accounts currently. Um, I'm known for my predilection towards the short side. Um, not surprising considering my relationship with Nader and my very good, strong relationship with Alan Abelson, who was a lead writer in Barron's and was a leading investment skeptic. Um, I write a lot. Jim Cramer and I had a, a company called TheStreet.com, which was recently acquired by a firm called Maven, which acquired Sports Illustrated, among other assets. Um, I teach at the Yale Graduate School of Business. I teach in Robert Schiller's course. Uh, Bob won the Nobel Prize for Economics about six years ago. That's about it. OK, terrific. Uh, the stock market stuff, go back to some of the things that you brought up, uh, Vincent, uh, earlier, OK? Um, you've got price up there and momentum, all right? And then you also have divergences. But what I didn't see is sentiment. Is there a reason why sentiment wasn't included in your slides? Uh, yes. Uh, sentiment is not really something that we track because it's not about, that's just about how people are feeling. It's not, it's not what they're actually doing. That we care about what they're doing, not what they say they're doing, not what they feel like they want to do, but, but what they're actually doing. Okay, and does sentiment, uh, does sentiment also, uh, okay, yes, Doug. I, I want to ask a similar question I asked last year. Okay, do the uh, mic that way, though, because so, he's recording also. 
You're going, you guys are on TV again. It's, uh, it's, it's my face out Florida TV. It's, it's my general belief that uh, market structure has changed. The veracity of technical analysis has, has queer charts, uh, specifically with the um, popularity and the prolif proliferation of ETFs uh, combined with the huge market share inroads of quant strategies and products like risk parity um, have basically accentuated short-term moves in the market. Um, and uh, of course, the overri overriding all of this, like godlike, is the Federal Reserve, who has provided all this liquidity. So I asked a technician this question, Vince, last year, and I'll ask you again. Are you as confident today in interpreting the stock charts as you were in, uh, in the past and over time? Yeah, in other words, has the market structure changed so much, if I may paraphrase, has the market structure changed so much and these other factors, including things like completion strategies, et cetera, from institutional investors, has that skewed it in a way that makes technical analysis perhaps less valuable than it had been in the past? Um, I would say that unless we see evidence that, for example, if we, if we saw that we didn't have divergences or any signs of underlying weakness headed into, let's say, the September 2018 top or, or, uh, or even into, uh, you know, any of the tops before that in, in you know, 2015 or, uh, or in 2011, then I would say you're right. But uh, the fact that we still see those signs of weakness show up and give us that early warning um, that's what we really we really need. We we don't really look at the short term, me, but we look at the the longer term picture from a longer term perspective and the data that we analyze. In terms of spotting, you know, market tops, um, it still works. So until it doesn't. Okay, so this will this will be okay. very brief. I know you're you're the program um, <laughs> by now. <laughs> Not quite. So if we were sitting here on December eighth. 2018, um, what would your house view have been on the market at Lowry's when the market collapsed to around 23, the S&P well, to around 2320? But a fair question might be, what was the view in September before it actually began to collapse in October? We'll have two because, parts. Right. That's good. That's because good. it started, the collapse started in October. That's correct. It bounced out in early, late November, and then boom, got smashed again. Okay, so Vincent, thoughts? Yeah, so... In September, we noted the negative advanced decline line divergence. It was three weeks long, and some underlying weakness that was that was occurring. We said, uh, stay away from small and mid caps; they're going to underperform. Um, but you know, we weren't in a position to say that there was a major market top that was forming, but but something that looked like a correction. How deep that correction was going to go, we don't have, you know, we don't have the tools like anybody else that's going to identify that. But what we what we knew what it was that it was not going to be a major market top that that pushes you off into a bear market. So it went further than we thought it would go, uh, and we had a sell signal that that did get triggered in early December. Um, but then we had a quick buy signal that got triggered on December 26th. And that buy signal was, was a product a big day. of... That was a big day. Right. But now, there was, yeah. in, that, in that disaster, in that, in that disaster, there were bear markets in certain sectors, and certainly individual names got absolutely slammed. There were names in October through November, December, that were down 30, 40 percent. Oh, yeah. Not, not necessarily the sector as a whole, but individual names certainly did enter a bear market during, during oh, yeah. that time. Yeah, I mean, in the chart that I have up, had up earlier that we showed last year said at the bottom, we had 80 percent of the stocks in our 3,500 stock universe were down 20 percent or more. So if you want to use 20% as a demarcation of a bear market, then those stocks, you know, were the vast majority of stocks were in, quote, unquote, a bear market. Right. So. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, there's a little something that, that I have done, and I don't know if, if, if Lowry has done uh, researches in this regard, but the, you know, the so-called golden cross, death cross, 50-day, 200-day moving average stuff, okay, uh, that you hear about that the media talks a lot about whenever you've done any, you know, media presentations or interviews, that, um, that when you leave out an added feature, dealing with the slope of the moving averages, you end up with too many full signals. However, in the time period that we're talking about here, you got all of those conditions. You had a breakdown, price below moving averages, et cetera. That's why I asked you about sentiment, and I'm glad that you answered it in that way, because price in this environment does seem to indicate you know, more validity, that you, know, you can't hide from price. That, now, Kenny. Your, your, your thoughts on that is, has the market structure changed so that, you know, some of the things that we look at are less valid today than they used to be? I, I'm not necessarily sure that I would say they're less valued. I will say that market structure has changed dramatically. And, and a lot of the market structure has changed as a direct result of the events of 9-11 and the ripple effects of that event continue to be felt today, i.e., you know, the fragmentation and the fracturing of the U.S. marketplace. Remember, prior to 9-11, the New York Stock Exchange was really the place where all listed stocks traded. NASDAQ is where the NASDAQ names traded, and they were the two major market centers. Post 9-11 and post those events, what it really did was it brought to light to the industry and to the nation and really to the world that here we were the largest developed market in the world, and we were still operating the largest developed market at a single location with 5,500 people looking at each other trading pen to paper in eighths of a dollar. The rest of the world was already trading automatically using electronics and using technology. And so that event then brought to light the risk that the US markets were at in terms of structure. And so as a result of that event, and, and, and it, continues to, it continues to kind of ripple today, is today we have you know, 10 exchanges, the New York being the only physical one. The other ones are all virtual. They trade in the cloud. You can't touch them, feel them, see them, visit them, because they don't exist anywhere. But as a result of that structure, and then there are 40 or 50 alternative venues, which are not even exchanges themselves. They are venues um, where you can also trade stocks. It's created this very fractured and fractured fragmented market center, and so it's difficult, um, it's more difficult uh, to kind of read and feel the market today because of because it is so fractured versus the way it was when everything would trade on the New York, you know, these things, you know, they used to call them tape readers, and there were guys that could stand on the floor and just read the tape because all the volume happened in one place, and you got a real sense of the market. Today it's much more difficult because of the fracturing, but the fracturing creates a lot more noise which then adds to kind of the conversation about, you know, it, it, has it invalidated technical signals? I don't think it has at all. I think tech, technicals play a real role. I'm much more a technician than, a, than I am a, a fundamental guy, but I think technicals play a major role. I think you have to understand the market structure today to better understand how to interpret uh, some of the data, because some of the data does get, does get blurred, right? It gets blurry because there's so much noise, and not only amongst the fractured market center, but there's so much noise because of what the internet produces. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all these, all, all these social networks that create uh, additional noise, which kind of, which kind of um, blurs the picture a little bit. But I do believe in the technicals. I do believe in, in the signs, the signals that uh, uh, technicians read out of charts in the market. And so I still, I would fall to the side, I would fall to Vinny's side saying, I'm much more dependent when I look at a stock, I look at a chart, I look at a sector, I like to look at the chart. I like to see what the chart has told me. I like to see what the chart is telling me, right? Um, but I will say that it has gotten a lot noisier as a result. So despite the noise, there's still validity to- uh, I, There's very, I think there's know, a lot of the validity. metrics being, being price, momentum, yes. you can use that in the divergences, uh, which uh, seem to be to I do believe category. that there is still validity to that. Okay, yes. what about, okay, before we leave the, the technical analysis here, yeah, most of the people here are non market technicians, they're more CFA types, so we'll get to that, you know, in a moment. And one of your comments that you had said earlier, Kenny, in regards to uh, uh, shareholder value, you sort of alluded to that, so, and I know Doug has some uh, views on that as well, but in, in the in the in the in the technical analysis realm, if we if we just stay there, uh, what about the noise factors that you know that Kenny is alluding to? 
Is there any, Vincent, do you think, and Doug, do you think that there is any validity to that impacting in any way, like high frequency trading, for example, or you take things like uh, exchange traded funds, which have a, you know, this risk on, risk off dynamic that's going on with it. Any, any views on any of that impacting the work that you do? And one other point, which is, is there any validity at all? In fact, actually, if you can do this one first, is there any validity at all that you believe, Vincent, in regards to pattern recognition? Pattern recognition being head and shoulders, flying wedges, you know, flags, pennants, cups and saucers, and you know, double bottoms, etc. Have you found any of that? Because that wasn't in your material either. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, when you're talking about single stocks, um, maybe that comes into play. Um, but when you're talking about the market overall, which is really what we do, um, you know, I, I would say that y you really have to defer to the internals, you know, the health of the market. You know, what is the health of the market? But when it comes to single stocks, um, I, I think marrying together the uh, the fundamentals, which I think is, is very, very important on a single, single stock basis uh, with some form of technical analysis. Maybe it's not pattern recognition, but at least understanding that um, a stock is in an uptrend or a stock is in a downtrend. So uh, if a stock is in a downtrend, you just know that, hey, maybe you're early. Let's just maybe wait a while for some stabilization because this is a really good story on paper, but uh, the market hasn't recognized it yet. Maybe when it starts to recognize it, uh, we'll, get a, we'll get a shift, and, and then that'll be the better time to move. So I think putting those two things together on a single stock basis uh, was really important, but uh, on, a, on a whole market basis, I, I don't find a price-only indicator is particularly useful. Uh, so momentum, but momentum is really a derivative of price, correct? It is. It is a derivative of price, but we're, we're, then we're kind of mixing together. Then you know, what's the the form of momentum that I, I that I kind of brought up there was the percent of stocks that are in uptrends, because that's what we're really trying to figure out is you know, uh, is the bulk of the stocks um, kind of inflecting and turning up? Are they mm -hmm. continuing higher? Or is this all just kind of an illusion on the surface where, you know, prices are moving higher of the major indexes, but because they're the way they're constructed, um, we're not seeing the degradation that's going on underneath. So it's really a combination, and, and that's why we use so many tools to, uh, to listen, as I say, listen to the market and what the market is telling us about its health. Okay. The, the thing I'd like to do, and, and then we'll, we'll leave this topic if we if we could, is that I think one of the criticisms of technical analysis, I think is valid, which is just like with the CFA program, when I taught the equity classes for the New York Society, I would try to describe the equity portion that uh, level two candidates were going to be taking the test uh, uh, in that area, that basically the CFA program is on average a mile wide. It, it's a mile wide, and on average, the water is an inch deep. However, you need to know where the 10 foot holes are along the way. So, not everything is equally important. Okay, and th this is my only criticism of technical analysis. Price, you can, you can, with momentum, you can show statistically it works. If you can, you know, divergences, works. Pattern uh, sentiment, no, because sentiment is like a rubber band. It just, you know, it could be anything, you know, that type of thing. M markets can be irrational longer than you can remain solvent, John Maynard Keynes once said. Okay, so you've got uh, the sentiment. Uh, and then the last uh, figure is pattern recognition, which is, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I looked at a head and shoulders, whatever. You know, yeah. and it worked, then it didn't work. Then it worked, then it didn't work. It's yeah. like a 50-50, flip of the coin. Where we, have a problem, where we have a problem with um, that version of technical analysis is, is it brings in subjectivity. You know, we are, the way that we are, we are operating, the way that we operate as a firm is a uh, lack of emotion, lack, uh, you know, total objectivity. So when you bring in something that you can look at in a hundred different ways, um, then that's not what we want to achieve. So mm. I, maybe that's what you're... Kind of, well, well, yeah, kind of yeah, moving just, towards is I mean, that it's subjective. Yeah. Yeah. If you go back and and you do this whole thing about looking at a momentum over time, and if you tweak it enough, you'll end up with something that gets you 70% probability. You know, that's why the, you know whenever I've done any media programs, uh, you know, and I get asked the question about uh, uh, golden crosses and death crosses and stuff like it's nonsense. 
I mean, you know, the stuff is like a flip of the coin. The same thing with pattern recognition. Yeah. I just can't, you know, many people have made a fantastic career out of it. <laughs> you were talking about careers before, uh, Phil. They made a lot of career. Many people working at firms, they made a career out of this pattern recognition stuff. I just, I can't find it working to uh, any degree. Okay, on the fundamental side, okay, Kenny said something, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, Doug, in regards to, alluded to shareholder value, you know, and where I, where I heard where Kenny was referencing was the, the thrust over the last 40 years of neoliberalism, the whole neoliberalism view of how the economy works and how uh, people have a strong interest in, you know, in being active with the, uh, with the pursuit of, of opportunities that are there. Okay, this is an election year. And if there's anything that a couple of the Democratic candidates are saying, it's really a frontal assault on neoliberalism. Okay, you can call it socialism, you know, Bernie's socialism and stuff like that. But it really is, and a lot of the comments, the business roundtables comments about, oh, we need to be more, you know, uh, more stakeholder oriented and stuff like that. Do either of you guys, my gray beard panelists up there, since I have a gray beard, I can say this. What do you guys think about, you know, where we're at economically? Where are we at from that point of view in terms of uh, in this election year? And, and let's take Vincent's comment, 26 months. 26 months from December of 2018, okay? That puts us into 30, 39 months from then and is the average of those. Okay, but yeah. well, it's gonna put you into 2021. Okay, somewhere in any. Thoughts on, on, on the economic picture, the election this year, and the assault on neoliberalism? Anybody have any views on that? Doug? You go first. Kenny. And if you don't want to answer that, then answer whatever the heck is on your mind. <laughs> so, I think it was back in 2011, I wrote an editorial in the Financial Times called The, the, Turn, the Turn of Screwflation in the Middle Class, in which I described a widening uh, wealth and income gap that would have broad social and economic consequences. And I think what you just described in terms of the political evolution in the, our country, but it goes much, it's much broader, it's in happening in Europe and elsewhere. Um, it has broad implications socially, economically, and for the markets. Um, Brett Stevens, did a good editorial in the New York Times. Brett is a friend of mine, he's a conservative uh, writer. In fact, I, I have him speaking at my uh, country club Sunday night um, in Palm Beach. Um, talked about how similar Bernie Sanders was, in a sense, to Donald Trump. Um, and if you, ha if you have a chance, just Google uh, Stevens uh, Sanders and Trump, I think it was about 10 days ago or two weeks ago. Now the world's changing and has important market implications, uh, policy implications. Uh, but it always depends upon what side of the pew you stand on <laughs> in terms of its interpretation. And any, any thoughts, Kenny, in, in right. regard? So, uh, listen, I think it is an election year, so it's going to be important for the markets, right? And, uh, and I think the first quarter here, until you get a better sense of who's rising to the top on that side, and you're going to get that, you know, February 3rd, and then Super Tuesday, which is March 3rd, you should have, we, should have, we should all have a much better idea of who's really, who's really rising to the top. And at that point, then you have to start to consider, okay, what's this platform going to look like? Is it Sanders? Is it Warren? Is it Buttigieg? Is it Biden? Um, and then what that platform potentially is going to look like like and then the implications from there about what could happen to the market what could happen to sectors of the market i mean look warren and 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 sanders want to destroy technology they want to tear apart the banks they want to tear apart healthcare, right and so therefore those three sectors right away at the would be at the top of anyone's list notice when warren was surging in the polls healthcare sold off big time because the market got concerned about what her policies and platform were going to be to healthcare. when she started to when she started to wane in the polls healthcare took off again because then the market suspected that 
maybe she wasn't going to be the candidate, and therefore the platform that she was putting forward would not end up being the platform that we were all going to be faced with. And so therefore, we're not going to get um, a view until we get a closer look at who the candidate is. And I think really by uh, Super Tuesday, there's going to be, you know, you're going to be down to two candidates, and then the market's going to really start to pay attention. But as a result, then I think, you know, the, we're in for some volatility this year. I think it's still we're in an uptrend. I think we are still in a bullish market. I think by the end of the year, we're going to be back to normal returns, maybe 10 to 12 percent all in. I'd be surprised if we had another 30 percent up year. Um, although I suppose if Trump cuts taxes again, like he said today at Davos, that, you know, there's tax 2.0, tax cut 2.0 coming, you know, maybe we do get another surge. Although I think the market's going to return normal. But yes, I think you have to be concerned about policy um, and potential, the potential of what's going to happen to policy based on who we see rising to the top and whoever that may be. I think, you know, right now, the really the four top choices are what everyone thinks is Sanders, Warren, Buttigieg and, uh, and Biden. <laughs> and so, therefore, I think, you know, between Biden and Buttigieg, I think the markets are okay. Sanders and Warren, I think, you know, they're way too far to the left. I think the market comes under some pressure, or sectors of the market come under some pressure. Okay, we'll get to I, some I, sectors, yeah. I do think that, um, on topic, more than any year in, in my four-decade career investing, that politics and profits will weigh on the markets. Um, I remember a line in The Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Um, it's the age of wisdom, it's the age of foolishness. And by that I mean, in terms of profits, we had the entirety of the 30% rise in the S&P last year, a function of a valuation reset, higher price earnings multiples. So it's really, the te it's incumbent upon um, corporate profits to rise to kind of move in and rationalize the current valuations. And in terms of politics, the way, the, however it falls, it's gonna have a huge implication. Policy will have a huge implication on the markets. Um, I wrote a piece yesterday, I used Apple as a metaphor for the market. Um, uh, it's a symptom, not the cause. Uh, uh, Apple's operating profits for five years have stagnated. The entirety of uh, the gain in 2019, 100% gain in the share price, was a function of a valuation reset. So Apple must, it's incumbent upon Apple's stock pro uh, company to grow into the stock price. Uh, the same applies to politics. If we get an extreme, um, in my view, if we get Trump reelected or if we get Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren on the other side, the market's going to have a lot of problem. My friend Lee Cooperman thinks that the market will open 20 percent lower if Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders is elected. I think he's right. I think um, he's right. So, you know, we have this unusual situation where the market's up 30 percent and earnings are down year over year. And frankly, the leading economic indicators indicate that um, there's going to be no material improvement in the fourth or first quarter. So um, we'll see what happens. Okay. Now, it, it, you had just mentioned a moment ago, uh, Doug, in regards to the age of. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask everyone here uh, a phrase, uh, and it's after it, from a book. It's from the title of a book. Uh, I'm curious to see how many people have ever heard the phrase, because the name of the book is called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Yes. How many people have heard that phrase, surveillance capitalism? I've read the book. It's a good book. One, two, and I think I saw a hand over there. Three. Three people out of the whole room Okay, so there's your homework. <laughs> Find out about surveillance capitalism, <clears throat> all right? And uh, you can catch a Bloomberg Radio segment that I did with Rana Faruhar from the Financial Times. She's written a book called Don't Be Evil, which is the original slogan for Google, which is the personification of surveillance capitalism. You know, yeah. And, and the, the book by uh, Shoshana Zuboff, which is a doorstopper. <laughs> it's 500 and some odd pages with 200 pages of footnotes. Okay, that is the age of surveillance capitalism. Read it, 
And now let's go to something in regard. This is perfect that you read it. Okay. <clears throat> Do you think Apple's issues and, and difficulties with profits has to do with the fact that they have not embraced surveillance capitalism, which means watching. Watching like Facebook does, like Google does. Well, they've been antith they're antithetical to Facebook and Google. Okay. Um, uh, Cook's policy has been, well, he's, he's facing pressure now with Trump. Mm -hmm. to uh, release the data from the phones of the, of the um, right. mass murderers. Um, but do you not believe that Apple's been surveilling you all along anyway? You think they haven't been doing that? <laughs> well, maybe they haven't. I, 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 I mean, yeah, but maybe they haven't monetized it the way that Google and Facebook have monetized it. It's, a, sin, the it's a sin qua non for Facebook and Google, surveillance right. capitalism. I mean, that, that's... That's what guides their profits. Apple, it does not guide their profits. Well, okay, that... right. And the argument that's made by Rana Faruha, okay, and I'm hoping to do a second... You have to read this book. This, it's right. amazing that I just finished it, Yeah. and it's, it's a tough read. It's a tough read, but, but it, it, it will enlighten you in regards to where pretty much all companies are going. If you don't think Walmart's going there, Walmart's going there. They're, They're all there. there. Yeah, They're well, they, there. but they haven't monetized it to the same extent that Google and Facebook have. That, that's kind of the issue. Okay. Okay. That's where they're moving in that direction. And that's where this kind of becomes an interesting dynamic if you understand the, uh, the issues that are there. So, okay, so then from a market analysis point of view, Vincent, I mean, you know, you said before it's not the fangs, it's not just the big tech, it's across the board, and yet these companies have been, from a market cap point of view, been major drivers in you know, the, the, the market rising higher. Is that not something that, you know, that is a bit of an issue, it's sort of like the narrowing of the market? From a price point of view, not from an advanced decline point of view. Right. Um, I mean, the way that I, I guess the way that I would answer that would be that um, it more has to do with you know what is what is leadership and what is breath, right? So, you know, I think it's it's good to have leaders, um, and if they're and if they're the leaders, then then it's good to know that they're that they're healthy and 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 what they're doing, um, but they're not gonna, you know, the market's not gonna go go to the wayside if, if the fangs, you know, begin to underperform. You know, I, I think that's important and an important distinction to make between, you know, leadership and market breadth, you know, how, how broad is the advance, how broad based is it, so. But, you know, that's, it, it's interesting that you say that, but the fang stocks are clearly the ones that everyone focuses on. They're the high growth, they're the sexy names, everyone wants to be in them, they're over, you know, they're, they're, they're way over, over owned by everybody, right? And what we see, what we see happening, is that when you get a piece of negative news, whether it's technology, whether it's U.S.-China trade, whatever it is, they immediately hit naturally the big names because they've had the biggest move. They're sexy. You can get in and you can get out. Whatever. Um, it ends up that that tone, that negative tone, all of a sudden makes the bottom fall out, or feels like the bottom's going to fall out. So everything gets dragged down with it. Certainly, the fang names get dragged down the most because they're the most visible. Uh, but they end up dragging everything else with it. Whether they should or shouldn't, they end up getting dragged down. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's a temporary effect, but but to the extent of bringing down, you know, bringing down the market for a you know prolonged period of time, I, I just, you know, it's such a broad advance at this point that I don't I don't see it as a concern. You, uh, was the underperformance in 2018, Vincent, uh, the underperformance by um, uh, small and mid caps? Was that a reason why Lowry said, you know, stay away from them? Well, what we saw actually was that they had outperformance, uh, a string of outperformance. And if you look through the history of this bull market, there, there was a consistent pattern of periods of outperformance of small caps followed by periods of weakness. And it was... It was very clear, and, and it was just a period of it was just alternation between those two things. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, when we made that call, which was in June of um, 2018, we said that um, 
you know, listen, small and mid caps have been performing relatively well. They've been outperforming. Um, you could probably make the case ever since the election, right, mm -hmm. um, that they were outperforming. But there was a there was a streak there that they were really on fire for the last you know eight or nine months before that. And we said, you know, that the, the probability is that they're going to underperform now to, to okay, kind so of unwind them to the upside. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and then and then of course you know they did start to underperform to the extent that you know the Russell, for example, made its high uh, in in late August, you know, and then, you know, the, the, the major market indexes didn't make their their highs until September 20th, and in the case of the Dow Jones Industrial, not until uh, not until the 3rd of October. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you did see that happen, and, and when that does happen, um, it, it affects breath in the internals, because there are so many more small caps than there are large caps, just in terms of numbers. Okay. Um, dessert has now served, so that's a signal to me that I'm coming to the end of my segment, so I'm going to ask a few more questions here, and then if all of you can think about questions that you would like to ask, uh, that would be, you know, that would be perfect. Um, two areas. Uh, get your views, uh, Doug, over to Vincent, okay? Interest rates. Views on rates where they're at specifically medium and long term. Thoughts, Doug, on that? Where we're at, where we're going? Well, we had this conversation a year ago, and there was total unanimity that interest rates would be going higher. The average estimate for the 10 year was 3.75%, if you recall. Mm -hmm. And I do this, my surprise list, and my uh, surprise was that interest rates, the 10 year would fall to 2.2%. They obviously fell to 1.6%. Um, I think that, you know, I talked in March of 2009 about stocks making a generational low. I believe in June or July of 2016, uh, bond yields made a generational low. Um, we threatened that 135% on the 10 year um, during 2019. We're back up to about 1.78% today, I would guess. So I'm going to uh, be a contrarian again and say, despite the fact that we're going to see subpar economic growth with real GDP, probably somewhere between one and one and three quarters percent, which is out again outside of consensus, um, with the burgeoning deficit, with both parties oblivious and unconcerned about deficits, um, I say that we're going to move back up to 250, 275 on the 10 year, which no one is expecting. The same people that expected 375, 4% a year ago are saying that it'll be 1.5% to 1.7%. Um, for that matter, equity forecasts a year ago were your typical plus 8 or 10%. No one was right on that either. So uh, there goes the value of a financial forecasting panel. <laughs> well, it's the thought process. Byron Reed once said when he was asked by the Wall Street Journal when we were doing a New York Society forecast, why are we doing this? And, and he said, well, it's not the actual forecast, it's the process, and that's what matters, and then everybody can make their judgments. My favorite Byron Wien quote is, disasters have a way of not happening. <laughs> Kenny, your thoughts on interest rates? So I think interest rates. I think interest rates uh, are going to stay where they are. I actually did was not a buyer of the last two cuts. I thought rates were fine where they were prior to two cuts. I didn't think we needed it. Quite honestly, I think the Fed felt honestly pushed into a corner. Whether it was pushed in by the administration, by the market, everyone bitching and complaining. The minute they don't do anything, the market goes into a temper tantrum, and 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 Jay Powell and the Fed feel like they're pushed into a corner. So I think quite honestly, the last two cuts were really they they called it the insurance cut fine. That's fine. Uh, I think it was just easier to say, you know, cut the rates and then and then leave it alone. So we don't have to listen to it, quite honestly, to listen to it anymore. Uh, Trump was on TV today at Davos or yesterday calling for lower rates this year. He still wants the Fed to cut rates. I do not believe the Fed is going to cut rates. It is an election year. I think the Fed's going to stand pat because they don't want to be seen as partisan. So therefore, they don't want to cut or raise. And so therefore, unless we get a shock, we get, you know, all of a sudden inflation rears its ugly head um, that I think rates stay right where they are. I don't think there's going to be any movement in rates um, in 2020 uh, at all. So I think, I think you know, 
I think it's exactly where we're going to be. Now, again, I'll qualify it by saying unless suddenly uh, inflation rears its ugly head, which I don't think is going to happen as well. So uh, I, I find it, it's, it's amazing, Vinny, that we've been here for an hour and no one's talked about the most important and powerful impactor on the markets, the Fed. True. Um, because since October, we've had uh, M2 growth 14% annualized, which has uh, inputted all this liquidity into the system, benefiting all the uh, passive managers, of the, the hedge funds that are leveraging up to the hilt. True. And um, it seems to me we live in a crazy world. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps somebody will ask that question in the segment coming up. Uh, just a follow-up to you, Kenny. Okay, when you're on CNBC, it's okay when you refer to conditions as bitching and complaining? I mean, you, I mean is, is, no, that, is no. that allowed on there? I mean, you know, do you end up with people getting all freaked out? No, no, I wouldn't describe it that way on, on television. Okay, but, but dinner we can do it over here. Okay, that, that sounds good. Okay, very good. Yeah, I was going to let you slip by with that one. Okay. Uh, Vincent, interest rates, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we look at TLT just because we, we don't, follow the bond market the same way we do we just there's just the information just isn't there in terms of you know the numbers that we would have to look at but um, if you look at the TLT which is the, the kind of intermediate to long term uh, bond uh, ETF um, it looks like there was kind of a major you know a major top in price in the summer of 2018 that that was kind of tested recently here and um, you know, I think what I said last year was that this is the world's biggest super tanker. You know, the 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 interest rate. You know, the bond market has been in a bull market for as long as anybody can remember, at least uh, most people, uh, 40 years. And um, it's going to take a, a lot of effort to turn that, especially with all the other forces that are going on. You know, that are outside of the domain of normalcy with you know negative rates around the world, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's just going to take a really, really long time. But I, but I think. That, that you know yields probably have bottomed uh, on the long end, and you know going to gradually, gradually, you know creep higher over the very long term. Do you okay. think in terms? And do you think in terms of a TLT objective? Uh, no, not no, really we, in those terms. Yeah, we don't do like in terms of price target. Yeah. No, no, we don't. We don't do price targets. No. Okay. Now before we go to questions from everyone uh, here, last topic, and we'll go from Vincent over to Doug. Uh, a market that has really pretty much come to light of late is gold. Yeah, guys, have any of you at Lowry uh, in terms of gold, precious metals overall? Well, again, um, the way that we do our analysis really doesn't focus too much on different asset classes apart from equities. So what I have to do is defer to the ETF. So if we look at GLD and then sort of the the inverse of that, which would be UUP, the you know the dollar representative dollar, uh, we can see that you know the UUP is sort of uh, weakened a lot uh, in, I guess, the last you know four months or so, and that of course has meant that the dollar is, has you know broken out. And, and I would just say that um, gold did have a good year last year, but uh, I'd be. Uh, it doesn't look like at this point that you can make it a definitive case for another strong year for gold. It looks like it's it's kind of running up into um, you know some resistance. So. You know, we'll see how mm -hmm. how GLD does, but um, mm -hmm. you know, certainly right now the demand has been has been good. as from what we track. Okay, um, Ken, thoughts on gold? So microphone. I think, I, I think that gold, in fact, did have a nice year last year. It did break out at the 1300 level, traded all the way up to 1615 during the crisis two weeks ago with uh, U.S. and Iran. It has since backed off to the 1555 level and has been there since uh, for the last you know ever since that calmed down. I, I, my sense is that we're going to be somewhere between 15 and 1600, uh, at least for what I think is the first half of this year. And then I think really the price of gold is going to be very much dependent on the geopolitical situation, not on the economic situation. So as as uh, as the geopolitics either heat up or not, uh, gold will react the same way we saw, you know, gold spike enormously uh, at the beginning of the year when we had, you know, the the uh, the Iranian crisis with the with the embassies and then the the re, the, re, the retaliation. Um, but if the geopolitical situation comes down, then I think actually gold just kind of comes down. I think it's a mm -hmm. I think it's a I think it's an asset that you should have in your portfolio, whether you own it physically or whether you own it in a in, a, in an ETF. Um, but I'm not looking for gold to have the same move as it did in 2019. 
Okay, and Doug, any thoughts on gold? You know, I used to uh, be like Warren Buffett or Howard Marks. Howard Marks used to say, gold is like religion. Either you believe in God or gold or you don't. Um, um, Snow, uh, Mae West used to say, I used to be like Snow White, but I drifted. <laughs> um, but now with this, with the inmates taking over the monetary and physical houses, um, with the advent and acceptance of modern monetary theory, coupled with, as I said previously, both Democrats and Republicans not giving a damn about uh, the dual deficits, well, let's say our deficit and our debt load, um, it might be the time for gold. You might see an explosive move on gold on the upside. I've owned GLD since about 119. It's 146 today. Uh, normally, I, as, a, as a value investor, I would be selling. I'm not selling. Okay, very good. All right. Um, we left a lot on the table. We've not talked about sectors. We have a whole range of areas that we can explore with questions from all of you. So, okay, this is good. We'll start here, and then we'll go right over there. So you first. Yes. Uh, this is for Doug. Um, I don't doubt, Bill, that you've been here six times. But I think the summation of your quality feels like you've been here ten times. You're known as a perma bear, and that's the way I view you. Uh, I... My personal allocation has always been about 90% equities, a la Warren Buffett. I found it interesting that you talked with Robert Schiller and that he's good friends with Jeremy Siegel. My question is, I think you made one of the great bold calls when you, in March of 2009, said we've hit a generational low. Do you still believe that to be true? And conversely, do you see the potential for a generational high anytime soon? Uh, let me get the second point. It, saying a generational high is really stupid uh, because we have um, inherent growth. We have a gravitational pull of equities higher, seven or a half percent or so, over a century. Um, I. It was actually that was a really easy call, and I don't think we'll ever come. In, in, in my lifetime, which is in this generation, will never hit 666 on the S&P or anything close to it. Um, I do think the, mar the market is, is fundamentally overvalued, perhaps materially so today, um, but I don't think it will ever be threatened. Okay, uh, you and then, no, no, the gentleman over there, he had to say it first. Yes. I guess I'm an immigrant uh, from Canada. I follow the political elections over the years, and it seems to me the U.S. has either gone slightly left or slightly right. Do you see the amount of change enough to go away from that model in the current election? Anyone have any thoughts on the political dynamic changing from kind of shifting the polarization that we have and so I'll, I'll jump in and then you can jump I, my fear is because you're right I think for the most part we tend to be just to the left or just to the right for the most part I think though there is this this cycle feels different to me um, it feels like there's a whole generation or two behind us uh, that are feeling either left out or feeling like the world owes them something or feels like America owes them something. Quite honestly, everyone in this room will say, America owes you nothing, right? You work hard, you get up every day and you work hard and you reap what you sow. And there's this generation now or two behind us that are suddenly don't have that same viewpoint. And so my fear is, uh, although I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to play out, but my fear is that both Sanders and Warren play right into that, and that this generation of 19 or 20 or 25 year olds who really don't even have a concept yet of what their life could be like um, are going to come out in droves, and I think that could sh clearly shift 
uh, the demographic, the voting demographic. Uh, and that's, that's what concerns me about this election. Now, on the other side, um, you know, on, on the Republican side or on the Trump side, you know, you could clearly get the real right wing conservatives come out in droves as well. Uh, but, but my sense is that the, 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 the generations on the left, my sense is that they're more motivated to come out because, you know, they like the idea of uh, free tuition and they like the idea of, you know, getting a check every month from, from somebody who's going to just write them a check and free health care and free this and free that. Uh, and so that's my fear. And so, yes, I, I, I'm concerned about this particular election, but it's gonna, a lot's going to depend on what happens by Super Tuesday because we'll really see. My, my, gut is, my gut is telling me, as much as I'm fearful of Sanders and uh, Warren being the, being the nominee, in the end, I, I, I'm putting my faith in the country that they're too far to the left and that you know, it's going to be somebody more to the center. I, it's, I came across an interesting stat. Uh, microphone in in 1960 30 percent of the young adults between 25 and 30 uh, se uh, excuse me 70 percent of the young adults between 25 and 30 felt their um, living style would exceed that the standard of living would exceed that of their parents today it's down to 33 percent that's a really profound, fundamental change. As I said, it has social, economic, and market implications. We see it in the elections around the world. We're going further to the right and further to the left. And there's no room for the center. I, I have a question for you. Uh, that's been concerning me. Meghan Markle, is she, is she going to live in Vancouver? Or Montreal? Toronto. That's where she lived before she got married, right? Toronto. I hope they reboot Suits. <laughs> OK. Uh, yes, you had a question. Uh, this is back to Doug off of what Jim was saying a moment ago. You mentioned you think the market here is overvalued. But how do you, do you feel that way um, with respect? Everything is relative, OK? like. Prices and everything is relative. Do you feel that with respect to what the rest of the world has to offer in terms of the financial markets? You mean the U.S. versus yes. non-U.S.? Yes. The money's got to go somewhere. Oh, yeah. More the mo money, there's reason. money out there. The money has to go somewhere. You said you feel the U.S. market is overvalued, but are we the best house yes. in the neighborhood? Best house in a bad neighborhood. We are, but. Last year, I mentioned three questions that I wake up every morning at 3.30 or 4 o'clock and ask myself, relevant to your question, and which concern me increasingly so. I'm going to try to remember them. You should be drinking white wine. I'm a little disappointed in you. I, I, I had vodka. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's not like you. A little key. I'll Chianti? Drink, I'll drink white wine after. Um, the three questions are, are we as citizens and investors as safe as the markets presume? Two, getting back to your question. In a flat, interconnected, and networked world, can the US be an oasis of prosperity? Remember John Dunn, no man is an island. And three, cooperation and coordination between the G7 countries has never been worse. And when the wheels fall off, what's the policy going to be and how are we going to get the wheels back on the wheel, on the car? So I'm pretty concerned. Uh, as it relates to the other thing that in my investment career, I have always had a basic principle, a basic tenant that I stick to my knitting. And my knitting is in the United States. I found that in Europe, especially in Asia, the transparency and governance issues are kind of a non-starter for me. I have enough problems dealing with Apple. <laughs> so this is what you think about at 3.30 and 4 in the morning? I mean, you're waking up on- Sadly. You know, 
I'm Sadly. at the age of 334 in the morning. I have to figure out why do I have to go to the restroom again? Yeah, but I, I said, I mean, you know, it was like the third I time I went during the night, whatever, you know, just enough. I should have shrink. I should have. See, Vinny, uh -huh. Vinny's smart. He's not at that point but, yet. No, Vinny don't isn't. Don't worry no, Vinny about isn't. I, I've, no, got Vinny a, isn't. I've got a two-year-old who does not like to I, sleep, so no, I'm up all the me. time. No, uh, no, no more bitching and complaining. No, but uh, just to her point, um, j just to your point, although the U.S. market may appear to be overvalued at the moment, I do think we are the prettiest girl on the block at the moment. Right, we are. No, we are. But I do think that there's real value in Europe. Again, I'd stay away also from Asia because I think the transparency issues in Asia, I just, I, I think that they just cause all kinds of issues. But certainly, I think there's opportunity in Europe. But while there's opportunity in Europe, um, I still think that the U.S. remains, you know, the prettiest girl on the block. I just, I just, part, maybe it's because I'm an American and I believe it. And I live here and I love it. But I, but I do think, uh, you know. Or we're the most handsome man in the room. What do you want me to say? Yeah. <laughs> you have to be gender neutral. Gender neutral. And I agree with Doug. And I think the points that Doug brought up are very important points, but I think they're important points about a decade from now. I think that's when they'll really, that, that's when that stuff will start to play off. Like I'm more What is your name? Melissa Kellenberger. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, let me ask you a question. So we're, you know, uh, this, this, we're the best, well, in the neighborhood, whatever. Um, the cleanest shirt in the laundry, whatever. So is anyone concerned that we've had the most massive tax, corporate tax reform bill two years ago? We have never, we're in a generational low effectively in interest rates. We've never had synchronized monetary expansion. We never had central bankers' largesse like we have today. Yet, we're growing at basically 1.8%, 1.9% in real terms. Does that concern anyone? Does anyone think that we've borrowed sales from the future in housing, in retail? installment loans. I saw a very interesting stat this morning that Liz Ann Saunders from Schwab uh, produced on Twitter. We're seeing convergence in the line of commercial industrial, the rate of change of commercial industrial loans versus the rate of change in corporate delinquencies. In other words, C&I loan demand, loan are slowing and delinquencies are rising. You know, I think I, I would be a lot more concerned than the markets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have, okay, the, the question back there and then you. So back there, yes. Hi. Um, I have a question and a concern that's been on my mind for a while. But first, I do believe the market is a great humiliator. That's its only objective. So we all think we. We can perceive and know what's going forward, but again, you know, the odds are against us. But my question is... Yeah, but that doesn't stop us from pontificating. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to spout out this stuff no matter what. It's it's it's, you know, that's entertainment. What's yeah. that? It's entertainment. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Um, no, I mean, I'm trying to do a little icebreaker. That's right. I do have a concern. I've seen, speaking of millennials, um, we all know the landscape right now, the millennials and home buying, let's say, looking for houses. And there is a concern of mine with homes in that million to two million dollar range. And it's not regional, it seems to be across the country. Um, whether you're in South Florida, Westchester, New York, uh, you know, other areas of the country, that million to two million dollar home that was purchased prior to the last market crash in 2008 recession, people that own those homes are having a hard time selling them because they're underwater now. And my concern is, coupled with millennials not looking for McMansions, or even, not even McMansions, depending where you are. You could be in San Francisco. <clears throat> $1.2 million home is small, right? It all, it, it's all relevant, or relative. But so my, do, you, do you have a question? That the my concern is, 
is that leading us up to a lot of the banks are foreclosing, or, you know, are people that can't sell these houses and pay off the loans, okay. and they can't sell them, and if the banks take the, the house back and try to sell it on the open market, trying to get their profit back, um, and I know it's all an accounting game for the bank, but I'm seeing more and more of this, and I'm a little concerned about, you know, we know what got us into 2008. You know, is there like this unspoken thing that's going on that's leading up to something? Any, um, have I follow the housing industry as a housing analyst, as I mentioned in my introduction, I kid her. Um, the conditions, the speculative conditions that took place in 05 to 07 are not in place. Um, I remember I was, um, actually I met Bob Schiller in a, in a CNBC uh, town meeting that Bill Griffith was moderating just at the height in, I would say, early 2007 of the housing market. And there was a bunch of people like yourselves out, and Bob and I were the contrarians calling for a collapse in housing, and we had... Um, the chairman of Lending Tree, the chairman of KB Homes, the chairman, uh, we had, what's his name, the guy that went to jail from Countrywide? Mozilla? Oh, Mozilla. Uh, <laughs> so, so, there was a guy, <laughs> this is not really, just an anecdote, to explain like we're not, although she's buying a house now. <laughs> um, um, so this is a young man, he's around 29 years old. He. You know, it was questions and answers. And he says to the panel, he says, well, I just bought my 11th house that I'm renovating, uh, you know, on spec. And I'm leveraged up the ass. And he asked the head of C uh, the CEO of Lender Street, can I get a loan from you? And he was leveraged like 20 to 1, 30 to 1, some crazy number. He obviously went bust. And I said, just just as an aside, remember this is 2006, and he just started, he was in the labor force in 1999, he entered the labor force. I said, by any chance, you, was your first job day trading stocks? He goes, how did you know? <laughs> and he was day trading homes, and then that ended badly. You don't have that anymore. Then there's, there's no arm risk. Um, reset risk, um, there's no low or no, do have you ever gone through trying to get a mortgage these days? Oh my God, it's painful. painful. Uh, there are so many uh, rules instituted to prevent what the low dock and the no dock, so I don't think it's a problem at all. But, but I and also it's where you live. You know, while, while I live in Palm Beach, you can't find a house for a million or two million dollars. Right, but okay, but Palm Beach is kind of a separate, a separate story all of its own. But I, I think to your point, um, I, I think there's another thing in play as well, Natalie. I think that the, um, I, I think that the, the millennials, the generation, they don't want the big house. They don't want three acres of land. They don't want the maintenance. They don't want the, all the stuff that goes with it. Right? They don't want to buy all the furniture that you have to put in a 6,000 square foot house. They just don't want it. And so therefore, I think that's part of that problem. Certainly, you know, listen, I just sold my house in Westchester, right? I mean, I, I, am, I was in that range and it took me a year and a half to sell it because I was in that range because they don't want it anymore. Not that, the, I mean, not that the house was that big. It was 4,500 square feet, but it was a big house, right? 4,500 square feet is a big house. And, and all, I, all I kept hearing was, it's too big for us. It's too big. Well, what the hell did you come for? So you see it in the pictures, why'd you come? But, but you know, they'd come and then they'd say it's too big. And then, uh, and so I, m my sense is that this generation, that, you know, they don't want all that. They don't want all the stuff. They want to have a nice house on a little piece of property. Might still be a million bucks, but it's going to be closer to the city or it's going to be closer to public transportation. It's not going to be six acres of land or three acres of land and, you know, all that stuff. So, I, and I think that's, I think that's just kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a generational thing. Well, certainly in Westchester County, where I was, there was a glut. There was a glut of those homes, absolutely. But part of it, where I where I lived in Westchester County, it was also you know the suburbs of New York, and New York itself, the New York economy has also gone through its own uh, uh, re rebalancing, right? Financial services, which really 
which really supported much of the tri-state economy up in New York, has been completely devastated because the financial services industry has been devastated. So therefore, that's part of that problem as well. Okay. Question over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, Doug made some good points. Uh, economy growing at 1.82 percent. You know, monetary stimulus, fiscal stimulus, we're borrowing growth in the future. But I think something we haven't talked about. Maybe the multiple reflects, you know, one of the biggest buzzwords in corporate boardrooms today: digital transformation. You know, when you talk to the companies, Accenture, they implement digital transformation, the Fortune 500, which are worried about all these unicorns changing their industry. And they are. Is you know, we're in the second, third inning. We're not even. We're going to be close to completing this transformation, making that more sensitive to customer through analytics, being able to move more flexibly at rapid speed to market more faster than the European counterparts and many Asian ones. So talk about the best game in town. I mean, digital transformation, I think, is setting the U.S. up for better growth and productivity in many years to come. I think that's in the multiple. Everybody? I I think it's a factor, but let me give you a fact. I tend to be someone that thinks the technology gets exaggerated because these things take longer to play out than people think. But anyway. Well, there's pluses and, minus, and minuses to, um, uh, what's the expression, surveillance uh, capital? Surveillance capital. Surveillance capital. Um, but I just want to, uh, randomly, I just thought of something less, less import, more important than what you said. If you distill what happened to the market in the last couple of years, the amazing rise, considering really the lack of operating profit growth, corporate profit growth, I think you, you can distill it into liquidity. And I think it's all, and I wish I listened to this to myself five years ago. I think it's all demand and supply. I'll give you a great stat. In 1999, there were 7,400 listed companies on the NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange. Do you know how many there are today? 3,700. 3,700. Phil. <laughs> Kudos. There are 3,700. Of the 3,700 that remain, 21% of the float has been bought back. So you have this massive liquidity. You have a gigantic change from active to passive investing, the proliferation of ETFs, quant strategies, products like risk parity, and their overwhelming supply. It is anti what was the uh, DLJ piece when we were kids? The death of equities? Remember the death of equities? It's the antithesis of the death of equities. Right. Yeah. And, and you also have the rise of private equity, too. Correct. A massive amount of money. Well, that's one of the reasons why you've had a contraction, because you've had mergers and takeovers and delistings, et cetera. Okay, we have time for, uh, I think, two more questions. Okay, why don't we go here first, and then we'll go to four. I have a question. There's been no mention of Bloomberg and no mention of the fact that he's appealing to the younger set on environmental factors, which personally make me nauseous. <laughs> Uh, our environmental, nobody has tapped on that, and I think that he could be a dark horse. What about a Bloomberg presidency? Anybody thoughts? Uh, I, I, uh, beyond the coasts, the East Coast and the West Coast, I don't think the center of the country has any, has really any recollection of who Bloomberg is. I don't think he's going to be, he can spend all the money he wants, but I don't think he's going to be a force. I just don't, I just don't see it. And I like him. I thought he was a great Mayor of the city of New York, absolutely, but I don't think the I don't think the heart of the country, uh, the core of the country, really has any idea who he is or why. And I, so, I disagree. And I, I, think I he's disagree. Play that billionaire card and people are going to be turned off. I disagree. I think that we underestimate the impact that money has on uh, the presidential election. Tom Steyer is a very good example. <laughs> totally unknown. He's fifth place now, and moving. He has a bullet if it was billboard charts. Um, I think more important than his candidacy for presidency is the fact, and I included this in my, one of my surprises for 2020, is that I believe he's going to commit 2 to $2.5 billion. Who, Bloomberg? For the president, not for his, I think he'll bow out, for the Democratic nominee and for key Senate races. Right. 
and that's going to be very impactful. That, that'll be the way he. That'll be the way. Mm -hmm. he that's his contribution. Okay. That'll be how he participates. Yeah, we're kind of running toward the end here, so I uh, wanted to let Phil have the last question. So uh, why don't you go first and then Phil? Okay, quick. Just a quickie. Any strong opinions on emerging markets? Yeah. Emerging markets from a fundamental perspective, and then maybe if you have any thoughts, Vincent, you know, on the market. I, 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 the way I see the global economy, I think they'll be submerging in the next couple of years. Submerging, okay. Submerging, submerging markets. Not emerging. Anything from a, from a market perspective, Vincent, on emerging markets? I think uh, the, the best house on a, on, a, on a good block or a bad block, whatever you want to say, is still the U.S., so I don't think there's really a reason to go too far out, out of the realm in EM. Okay. And Phil, last question, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Doug finally answered the question I wanted to ask him, or at least part of it. Every year, Doug does a thought piece on 10 or 15 surprises for the next or the coming year. And he had an excellent one about 10 days ago, 15 surprises for 2020. And he hadn't really gotten into some of the ones that he were the most heartening to people like me and my uh, spouse and intellectual companion. And that was in the political sphere. And the idea that we were really going to have a winnowing down and a cover to the center, and Bloomberg would be a key factor. Right. Uh, throwing his financial bow out, but he throw his financial weight to uh, the ex vice president in all likelihood someone like him that's in the center and is electable uh, and so we'll avoid uh, Trump part two or something worse uh, socialism so when you had a number of other very uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking points that maybe you could mention and I uh, suggest people Google uh, Doug's 15 surprises I had so many I don't well, can you pick up, like, you know, two of them or three of them? Um, well, I said the China trade deal will fall apart and that China's patience with Hong Kong will run out and there will be a global shortage of, uh, of protein. I think this African, African swine fever virus is serious and it could cause a global shortage of protein. And um, the immediate impact would be obviously terrible socially but also... Uh, a lot more inflation. I said that Tesla will trade at 600 in a speculative surge. It closed the year at 418. It hit 595 this morning and closed down 40 points from there. I think that the, uh, I think you have to watch out below for the automobile industry. No one's looking there. I think sales are about to plummet. And I think it will threaten the global and domestic economies. And I think Ford will be bailed out by Volkswagen this year. Um, and my favorite, is, oh, of course, is always about Warren Buffett, my pal. And I think that he will have surprises on several fronts. I think he will buy Federal Express, another large company, consuming most of his $130 million of cash. Uh, I think that he will um, basically buy uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, which out of bankruptcy. Um, it's, it's, it's normally uh, impossible to buy a regulated utility, but I think the authorities um, will, will give him control of the company. I think contrary to everyone's thinking, Apple is not a forever holding for him, and the surprise will be that he will sell a significant amount of Apple this year. And I think um, at his May 2020 Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, he will announce his successor, Angie Jane, and I think he will also invite me back in 2021 to grill him and Charlie. Okay, terrific. Okay, so with that, why don't we use that as your closing comment, because we're right at the end. Uh, that's true, unless you wanted to add something to that. And uh, Kenny, closing comment, a, a thought that you'd like to leave with everyone here. So, microphone. No, so I, I think... Microphone. Mike. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, um, that, that was actually very interesting. I thought that was great. I need to get a copy of that because I thought that was perfect. Um, no, my closing, my closing comment would just be that I think 
2020, because of we're in this political environment that we're in, is that people should not necessarily get lulled into thinking that um, uh, the market's not going to run into some volatility. I think it is. Uh, but in the end, I think you have to, from a long-term perspective, you've got to eliminate the noise and you're going to use the pullback as any buying opportunity because I think, we, I think we're still on a growth path and I do think that we're back to the you know, kind of 10 to 12 percent uh, return for the market this year. I think, uh, speaking of eliminating the noise, I said this last, uh, two, three years ago. I recommended, you recommended a book, um, Surveillance Capitalism. I have a book to recommend, uh, Navigating the Noise by Richard Bernstein. It's a fantastic book. Terrific. Get it on and Amazon. you can catch Richard Bernstein. I interviewed him for Real Vision. Anybody here a Real Vision subscriber? There we go. Okay. One, all right. Two. All right, very good. And Vincent, your closing comment, please. No, I just think you need to keep looking at um, things that really matter uh, and, uh, and monitoring the health of the market, not, not trying to figure out why, and understand that we are, uh, we are still in a bull market. Whatever age you want to call it, it's still, uh, it's still going. It's a bull until it ain't. Okay, very good. And my closing comment is just, uh, uh, this was really terrific. Every time we do a program, it's always unique and different, and, uh, and this one is along the lines of that, uh, really spirited, and I uh, hope that you found it to be productive. I very much enjoy a key part of, of doing these events is hearing the questions from all of you. What's on your mind? What's, you know, that becomes very revealing and insightful, too, and the areas of uh, where questions uh, uh, are coming from. And then the last thought, which is your word for the, to remember your homework, which is surveillance capitalism. And uh, Doug had mentioned something about Ford. Uh, can you believe it that Ford and surveillance capitalism are actually together? And you might say, well, what does an automobile company have to do with surveillance capitalism? Read the book, get Rola, uh, Rana's book, and I think you'll get some in insight into that. And with that, I thank all of you and ask you to please join me in thanking our panelists for the next week's discussion. Thank you.